This is HighIntensityBusiness.com with Lawrence Neal, helping you achieve your health and fitness goals. Become a great personal trainer and build your high-intensity strength training business. Lawrence Neal here, and welcome back to HighIntensityBusiness.com. Today's guest is Gary Knight. Uh, for the third or fourth time, I think. Uh, Gary is the high-intensity trainer and online hit coach. He's worked with thousands of people from different backgrounds and acquired expertise working with high-powered executives and CEOs. Gary, welcome back to the show, mate. Hey, Lawrence. How you doing? I'm very good and excited to talk again. Um, so you've developed a new program for people who are interested in high-intensity training, improving their results, and getting some coaching to help them along the way. And it's called HD Retro. And HD is short for heavy juicy, I assume. Is that right? Yeah, it's definitely a play on those words. But obviously, for um, copyright reasons, we, we don't spell out the full thing. But um, <laughs> it, gives, it gives people the gist, if that makes sense. Absolutely. So... I'm interested. I think it's a great way to package it. Um, it's an exciting video you've got there, the use of some interesting uh, music as well. So tell us about the program. What is it? Yeah, well, it's, it's, it's interesting that you open with it being a new program because I actually shot it several years ago. And it was basically after I got the, um, the YouTube stuff sort of rolling for a little bit and, and started to get a little bit of a following, I thought, time to try and monetize things. So I put together this program based on pretty much the, the routine in, say, Heavy Duty 2 or High Intensity Training, the Mike Mensa way. Um, filmed it all up, you know, really kind of polished film job, um, some programming, some welcome packs to go with it. Um, and then I was sort of going to sell it as like a membership or sell it through a website. And I ended up kind of getting out of the mines and moving across to London. And just for that simple reason, it kind of got lost to the annals of history. So now that I'm set back up home in Australia, I was kind of looking through the um, the old materials and I realized I was sitting on, on you know, a pile of gold in, in many ways. It was um, a fully polished product ready to go. I'd almost forgotten that I'd done all the hard work to get it ready and and I looked at the footage and it was very, very cheesy, of course, because I, I was going through my, my synthwave um, interest in music at the time and uh, it was just – it was a good job, good, good program, and I thought time to bring it to the marketplace. And um, instead of trying to sell it, I just thought, you know, it would make a really good way to kind of, um, I guess, maybe like an homage to Mike Mensa. You know, I think we're, we're coming yeah. up on 18 years since his death pretty soon, probably by the time the podcast goes out. And um, I think it'll be just a, a nice little gift to the hit community just to maybe get them excited about, you know, the um the old uh, retro style of training that uh, sort of took off in the eighties. Is he your main? Would you say he's your main influence in fitness, Mike Mensah? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, obviously, you do you do move on over the years, and when you get sort of books like Body by Science that kind of um, fill in the details that weren't really quite understood um, back when Mensah was writing you kind of fall back or you start to you start to buy science when you've got real proper science to underpin what you're doing that becomes what guides you and at the end of the day I'm very sort of empirical as a person so I'm data driven um, but definitely I think Mensa's writings you know they have a way of kind of stimulating the mental faculties um, and the fact that he's kind of got objectivist philosophy kind of moves throughout his philosophy of training. There's this kind of idea of sort of hero worship and and sort of building a, an aesthetic physique that can be sort of admired and put on a, on a mantelpiece a little bit. That sort of, yeah, definitely makes Mensa sort of a hero or one of those hero type figures that um, inspire a certain course of action over your life. So, um, that would definitely be true. Like definitely a, a big fan of Mike Mensa. Um, but like I said, once you sort of get the underpinning science, then you tend to worship the science and the facts a little bit more than say the man who introduced you to high intensity training. Yeah. Yeah, no. And just on that note, I want to talk about objectivism for a moment. Um, you know, I've started working with someone who's a huge fan of the objectivism philosophy, um, of Ayn Rand and, you know, he for a while now, obviously, I've spoken with a number of people in here who have been influenced by objectivism. Uh, and, you know, I've always had it on my list to read some of her books, 
you know, I've had Doug McGuff uh, recommend the Fountainhead to me. Um, a number of people recommend Atlas Shrugged. And I just hadn't, you know, for some reason, other stuff had just taken priority of other, other books and things. Um, and so recently I decided to qu- get a bit more into that. And I watched a couple of interviews with Ayn Rand, you know, some of the really old school ones from like, 19- I think one was like 1959 and another one was 1979. Yep. And I-, I loved it. You know, um, I loved every. I-, I agreed with a lot of what she said. I just really admired her ability to communicate ideas so clearly. Um, it was really quite inspiring. And um, I'm reading Atlas Shrugged, which... You know, I'm a pretty slow reader, but it is a massive book, isn't it? It's like, I feel like I finished a regular book by now, but I've only done 10% according to Kindle. So, but really enjoying it. There's a bit at the moment. Um, I've just read the bit. You've read Atlas Shrugged, I assume. Have you? Yeah, several yeah. times. Oh, wow. Okay. So there's that bit in it where her and um, Francisco are young and they're talking about how they had this kind of common understanding of values and life when they were very young and how everyone around them just didn't quite get it. And I just love that. There's something about reading it. It's just like, it's one of those moments where you're, you know, this stuff, but you didn't realize you knew it or you felt that way as you're kind of reading it. Um, And that's kind of this idea of, you know, well, this might not be completely accurate, but focus on yourself, make yourself successful. And that will ultimately be one of the most productive things you can do in terms of helping helping everyone else around you, helping the community and helping society. But, but I'd love to talk about that for a moment with you. Um, you know, a lot of people in, in high intensity training were very much um, into objectivism. And I'm guessing that's mainly because Mike Mensa was very much into Ayn Rand's philosophy and, um, and people got into Mike Mensa. And then obviously that's how they got really into that philosophy. So why do you think it is though, that it seems that that um, philosophy really resonates with people in this field? It's going to be a really interesting answer that I'm going to give. And I'm going to start off with just a little bit of a story. And then I'm going to say something that will rile up all of the objectivists out there, and even a lot of fans. So I'm going to be I'm going to be quite unusually controversial in the realm of philosophy. That's unusual for you, mate. That isn't the normal scope of your show, but it might be an interesting turn. Um, so, with with Mike Mentor, I first had high intensity training the Mike Mentor way from about the age of 15 or 16. Um, my mum had just like seen that I'd started training with weights for sport, and she just picked it up in a, in a books bookstore for me. Um, I kind of, I went through it, read it all, didn't understand a word of it. And then I got, um, Arnold Schwarzenegger's encyclopedia bodybuilding, read through it and copied that one. Cause it was Arnold Schwarzenegger, <laughs> such as the complexities of the teenage brain. Um, and it wasn't until sort of my early sort of twenties or late teens, I very much got into Ayn Rand and objectivism um, you know, I read the books, watched the um, film adaption adaptation of The Fountainhead. There's a black and white film of The Fountainhead that's oh, really? absolutely amazing. Gary Cooper's in it. It's a really, really good old black that. and white movie. Um, and, you know, I was in there hook, line and sink, sinker. Politically, I was kind of gravitating towards libertarianism at the time. And a lot of these things about, you know, the the individual and the rights of the individual as being the sort of underpinning way to organize a polity were very much um, in my sphere of influence. And that's very, very normal for um, younger men um, because they're what you call transcendent males. So they're males that are trying to kind of find their way in the world and they tend to gravitate to literature like Ayn Rand's that kind of sell this message of, you know, develop your agency as an individual and develop your own values and pursue your own interests um, and people tend to, to move off libertarianism into more, a more conservative perspective as they get older, just because they start families and have children. And then that kind of shapes their worldview a little bit that, you know, sometimes the, the main unit of a society is more the, the family unit than it is so much the rugged individual, not to throw out all of those ideas about, you know, developing yourself first. Um, but so I got into, you know, Mensa again after Ayn Rand. So then when I went back and reread that book, I realized that that Mensa, and he even sort of says at the start of the book, he's basically turned objectivism towards the, the exercise science domain. 
and kind of mapped out that entire way of thinking, that way of constructing arguments. And so the reason you get that sort of coalescence between objectivists and high-intensity training enthusiasts and libertarian and conservatives is simply because, you know, the, the form of logic and the structure of that logic is very, very similar. And it's what – it's – it's funny because like I really used to believe in that stuff in a big, big way, but the entire basis of most of the 20th century's philosophies is a pseudoscience. And what they essentially do is they build from ax- what are called axiomatic statements or axioms, um, like a house of cards where they fit all these logical statements together on top of each other. And they, they form what's called sort of an, intern- an internally um, consistent narrative otherwise known as a house of cards or pseudoscience. And so when you read Mensa, you can see how he kind of builds from these initial statements that are assumed to be true, these series of arguments that all make sense on top of each other. Um, And it's a very seductive way of getting people to kind of buy in very, very aggressively. It's like like excellent copy for people who have autism. You you read it, it's it's perfectly layered. (laughs) Everything's very, very logical and it just sinks into your brain and it captures you. It really captures your attention if you're inclined a certain way. And a lot of the sort of libertarian, the, the right-leaning crowd, um, they eat this stuff up, up, up very, very quickly. Um, but one of the things, when, when we're testing for truth, truth is a really complex idea. And um, it's not just enough for something to be what's called internally consistent, but it has to be externally correspondent. That is, those statements that happen within your little fantasy world or description of how you think the world is have to then map out and play out in the real world tested under real conditions. And luckily for Mensa, he probably didn't have the the means at the time to perfectly test with conventional science everything that he, he wrote as an exercise philosophy. But when we look at body by science, um, Doug McGuff's been able to kind of fill in the gaps so that Mensa's work transitions from being, you know, a philosophy to being underpinned by science and having those sort of, I guess, things that were intuited or guesstimated or or just came from the evidence in the training room were starting to be confirmed by more rigorous methods of the scientific method. Um, but it could very much be that many, many things that Mensa said could be completely disproven or the the way he phrased them could be invalid. You know, a lot of this talk about, you know, intensity and things like that, they're, they're talking, and it sounds weird, but often Mensa talks about these things at a very, very low resolution. So if, if you took, say, I think the second chapter in Body by Science is all about um, how muscle fiber fires, like, none of that was really known when Mensa was writing. So the whole way he talks about intensity and momentary muscular failure, none of it includes talking about how motor units are recruited and how like a, tr- like a real definition of failure today would not just be, you know, going to you can't move anymore. It would probably be when a maximal amount of motor units are fired such to the point that you can no longer move the weight because you don't have the resources or something like that. So that level of detail and abstraction and the underpinning science wasn't there when Mensa was writing. So a lot of a lot of what he put down was just it was like a hypothesis at best, you know, and um, that doesn't mean it it hasn't worked or that it's not in the process of getting proved or it isn't half proven now. But certainly at the time a lot of it was just, you know, logical statements stacked on top of one another that sound very, very good on paper, but it's a very big claim to say that they were at the level of science. Um, and that's one of the things you're going to find even with Ayn Rand. I mean, a lot of what she wrote is just fantasy literature for adolescent men. Um, it's, it's not, it's not all true, even though, you know, it tickles our instincts for, you know, that kind of political bent. Um, but again, something has to be externally corresponded in the world before we can sort of call it a truth candidate. So something that, for all the evidence we have for this reason and that reason appears true until such point as we find something that updates our view of it. Can you give an example of something she claimed or said that seems very logical, very convincing, which has been not the case or disproven and, uh, in modern yeah. times? 
Anything that comes I think to mind? One, one of the big tenets of her, her philosophy, I mean, I haven't poured over it in, in recent years, so I'm a little rusty, but she sort of has always made the claim that the meaning of man's life is his happiness. And that's that's just a sort of axiom, ax, yeah. axiomatic statement she sort of plucks out of thin air to then build her entire universe around. Um, and, you know, I'd say a lot of people – aren't happy and they spend good chunks of their time not happy. And it could even be argued if you look at, say, you know, what Jordan B. Peterson's doing right. at the moment is that, you know, it's sort of responsibility and meaning that are the things that we're going for. It's it's not happiness. Happiness is one of those kind of short-term fleeting things that we mm. – if we get a, a fair like bit a nice of it in our life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like a, a nice byproduct but not always a guarantee and certainly not, not the meaning of life. Um, but she just kind of declares it out of the ether somewhere and then, you know, builds a series of arguments behind it, which is, which is very, very complicated. Um, and even some of the stuff where she talks about, you know, the, the source of human rights. Um, so she, she might argue that uh, because the, the meaning of life is human happiness, um, you know, therefore things that contribute to that morally are, are the good and things that take away from that are the bad. Um, that's probably a bit of a weak argument because I'd need to, to reread her. But, um, you know, even a lot of the stuff she writes about the, the source of human rights and things like that are just, they're all just fantasy things she's put together. And they, they sound very, very nice. And when you stack them on top of each other, one logical comment after the next built upon, you know, the initial statement, it's like great copy that just kind of marinates your, your mind for her argument. Um, but if we talk about, say, the source of human rights, I mean, human rights, uh, they come from violence, really. So when you, um, you know, if you're prepared to, say, defend something like, uh, say, we go back to the Paleoithic era, if you're prepared to defend your life, you are then claiming your life as property. If you're prepared to defend a patch of turf or territory, you are demonstrating an interest in that turf or territory and you are backing up that claim with violence. And so your violence actually becomes the way in which you give birth to that claim or which you give birth to rights. And so then when you say team up together as a, a, tr a group a group or a tribe and say you want to claim a cave as part of your territory, when you agree to band together as warriors and swear an oath to each other and repel all, in, all invaders and only protect your family within that tribe, you then are claiming group rights. So one of the things that sort of moved me away from Ayn Rand and libertarianism was just understanding that, you know, you have to have an explanation for these things that exist in the real world. They're not just fantasy literature. So, you know, Ayn Rand would say, them, you know, the meaning of or the source of human or the meaning of life is, is a man pursuing his happiness, therefore this moral claim, that moral claim, but that doesn't really exist in the real world, you know. So everything has to come back to something that exists in nature and that can be demonstrated in nature and is in line with how humans behave, not just, you know, the, the great copywriting of your, your stories in a book. Yeah. Yeah, well said. Um very interesting. I I do definitely want to cover this in a bit more depth uh, in future podcasts. Um, you know, I think, you know, this is obviously not a, a podcast that's focused on philosophy, but I find it very interesting that, you know, some of these political positions and uh, uh, philosophies really do underpin the way, I guess, people behave and act and interpret information in high intensity training um, and towards business. So I do think it's relevant. Um, so we'll be doing more stuff on that in the future and perhaps we can do a podcast dedicated to that in the future, Gary. Um, but obviously keen to get back to your, to your program. So with, with HD retro, um, tell me, you know, what, so it's a, correct if I'm wrong, but it's a, is it a free, a free product that people sign up for? The, the, yeah, man. Website? Like it's basically, yep. yeah, basically uh, it's just set up on a, like an email list software and um, there's a landing page. You chuck your email in I shoot you out some emails that have got like all the videos in there, got a um, sort of like a welcome pack with just some short notes on how to use it, a few guides about, you know, how often you should train per week. Um, there's a log book in there so you can print out a sheet and record your results as you go, which is probably the most important part. Follow the videos, follow the form that you're shown um, and start recording results. Um, and then just once a week, I, I shoot through an email. Um, the first couple of emails I've set up in advance, um, 
go over the philosophy of Mike Mensa. So I kind of do my interpretation or my paraphrasing of his seven principles of, of high intensity training, um, which are, what are they? They're identity, intensity, duration, um, I think it's frequency, specificity, adaptation, and progression, something like that. And, you know, do, do a couple of pages on each of those just to kind of break it down. And I update a little bit of it too, inserting some of the modern science. You could almost see it as if I kind of sandwiched body by science and high intensity training the might mets away together and kind of married up the, the two, which um, I think is the best way to kind of understand it. And it was, it was good to kind of write it like that because you realize that Mensa's instincts, you know, they, they were spot on. Um, you know, there wasn't, I mean, the details weren't, weren't there, but as far as the, the practical application of HIT, you know, how we presented it, um, he built a really excellent game for making progress, you know, and a, a really excellent set of tools for thinking about, um, you know, progress and how to navigate your training. And, and I think the big things is decidability, you know, when this happens, what do I do? If that happens, what do I do? Um, which is kind of the, the big part of training, you know, so you can be strategic instead of kind of um, looking at stalled progress with confusion and not understanding why. Mensa's uh, principles allow you to kind of, you know, put on put a framework over, over your training and, and really understand why things may be happening and what to do about them. Um, which I think was his greatest contribution with those principles. You know, he, he gave you tools of decidability. Awesome. Cool. Okay. Um, so, okay, so you've gone through there kind of, you know, it's a free free, free product um, and, you know, you've obviously gone through what people are going to get. So, you know, you've been doing um, some form of high-intensity training, online coaching, you know, you've done it in person, you've done, done it online, um, you've done it for over quite a long period of time. Um, and obviously one of the things is, is you know, this – you know, when people sign up for this, they, they'll probably also get the opportunity to potentially get direct coaching from you as well, I assume, if they if that's something they wish to 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 go for as well. Yeah, man, absolutely. Um like I said, I mean it's a it's a program that it's probably pitched more at the the hardcore hitters, you know, the, the guys out there that are already um pretty comfortable with the territory and, and just you know, something to maybe get them back on track or or take another look at Mensa um, if they've been following a different um, derivation of, of HIT training. But, you know, my, my coaching services are always there. Um, but but for the most part, I'm, I'm there for people that are pretty serious and they've got a real problem to solve. Um, so if they do want to get at me, ask me a question, and, and if they really need serious help, you know, the, there's easy ways to find me or shoot me an email back. Um, and we can go from there. But, I mean, basically the product's ready to go. So um, you don't really need my further input unless you're really getting stuck with something or you really need a, a kick in the ass um, to get yourself into gear. So most of what I do as a hit coach is even though I use high-intensity training, you know, to put muscle on people, it's really just coaching people through habits and behavioural change so that they – Stop eating like assholes and lose body fat. You know, that's kind of it in a nutshell. Um, and, you know, every, every coach will laugh when I say that because they, they really understand that. Um, often when we go into, you know, online coaching, you know, we think, and, and even for myself, like with HIT, you think you, you're out there being a crusader teaching people how to, you know, lift the purest form of real exercise on the planet. And then you realize the the main way you help someone is actually by, you know, put the Twinkie down, put the cupcake down, you know, let's try eating meat for 30 days in a row and not drinking and you'll fucking look better. You know what I mean? Don't, don't concern yourself so much with, with the muscle gain. If you've got a, if you've got an excessive fat problem, you know, solve that first, um, get those habits right. And, and half the time the weight training takes care of itself if you're just consistent with it and, and don't injure yourself. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. Um, and you know, you can't, I mean, a lot of people downplay the importance of things like accountability, um, which you mentioned there, which is just a huge part of this. Um, I mean, it can be, even if you have all the knowledge, it can be so powerful to invest in someone for that accountability. And for me, um, what I find quite attractive about it, and obviously we're going to be, you know, working together for those listening, Gary's going to be coaching me, which will be fun. Uh, and we'll get to talk about that in perhaps future episodes to talk about kind of how that's going. Um, but I love the idea. So this is, this would be an interesting point for us to discuss quickly is 
I like the idea of outsourcing my thinking around training because I guess one of my, I, I get so bogged down in the minutiae about this. And, you know, people will know that having listened to the podcast that, you know, this podcast is a ridiculous example of hair splitting in a lot of ways. Um, I mean, I, I was just listening to some of my older episodes with John Little because I'm going to speak to him later today. And I just have to laugh at myself because it's like, it's like reading a really old entry in a journal and realizing how much of an idiot you were back then and then hoping that you're a slightly <laughs> smarter now. Um, but I do get, you know, well, we all get, I suppose, a bit confused by all the minutiae and training um, and just hope that, you know, we could get a little bit smarter over time. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I've got my own Google sheet where I've got my training records and I've got my, uh, my training plan and, you know, I fill that in on like a weekly basis, but it would just be really nice to not have to, obviously, you know, I understand that I'll be, you know, filling in the data, but it'd be nice to have someone just to help take some of that burden away in terms of, okay, what does my training plan look like? Um, what do I, what am I doing this week? Like from my perspective, that is huge because, you know, I've got a lot, uh, going on in my life right now i've got i'm trying to grow this business trying to get a podcast out once or twice a week um you know me and my fiance are engaged and i don't think i've announced this yet on the podcast we're actually having a baby um so nice. did, I tell you, did i tell you that or is that oh this no? is uh, this is the first news that's <laughs> wicked that. exclusive thank you very yeah. good yeah so we we have well, that's happening and that and uh, baby's due in uh, november this year um, remember, remember I had a fair bit to do with encouraging you to um, put rings on fingers and things like that, <laughs> I, I recall. Yeah, yeah, I definitely had some growing up to do for sure. Um, but yeah, so that's awesome. Uh, but then, so obviously planning for that, you know, making sure that, you know, we're, we're prepared for that financially and, uh, you know, just, just prepared. Um, and good, then, news, good news is, is when yes. you get married, your income goes up. And when you have a child, your income goes up. That's true for men, statistically. Oh, I can 100% believe that. Like the amount of stories I've heard of people who, um, who, whose focus became so much more enhanced after they mm -hmm. knew they were going to have a baby. Um, you know, my own business coach, um, James Shramko, who's been just huge for me definitely the best investment I've made in, in business coaching. Um, you know, he's, he's told the story of his own uh, business journey where, you know, he's got quite a big family. I believe he's got four, four children or five maybe. Um, and just, you know, as, as he's grown his family, his, his business success has just skyrocketed uh, and his mm -hmm. focus and his dedication, because what more purpose and meaning is there in terms of knowing you have to provide for someone you love, you know, and care about? Um, so that's, I guess that's kind of common sense in a way. So now I can believe that. But yeah, so we've got that. Um, and then also, um, you know, we're, I'm starting this personal training business as well, which is going to be, you know, another another business on it in, in itself but it's going to have a nice symbiotic relationship with everything else i do it's, it's going to be quite interesting to be able to talk about that on the podcast and within the membership so there's quite a lot going on and i certainly couldn't take on any more i feel like if i took on any more in terms of projects it would just dilute the rest and we we mm -hmm. talk about this quite a lot privately haven't we in terms of like you know you've got to yep. be careful how much you take on um so with all of that said um it's quite fun for me to think oh okay i could potentially outsource some of the thinking around my training, get a bit more accountability and support. Um, and, you know, even if that means for me as someone who's been training for, I don't know, almost 10 years now in some capacity in resistance training and, and knowing that I might not have much in the way of gains to make, um, it's, it doesn't matter because it's more about, I guess, mastery, see if we can move the needle and just that kind of accountability as well. Um, so yeah, I'm. A, I think I think this is a, a great a great offering, and obviously I encourage the listeners to check out the the program. What's the um, domain again for HD Retro? I mean, I will link to it in the show notes anyway. But yeah, but it's just it's hdretro.gr8.com. Okay, no, so. we'll link we'll link to it in the show notes anyway. Um, we should be over at highintensitybusiness.com forward slash HD retro. Um, so one thing I also wanted to mention is, um, you know, you're, you're, you're a coach who is also helps coaches. So for those that haven't listened to our previous podcast, um, Gary's also got a, a you know, business where he's helping people who want to set up their own online 
hit coaching business. Um, because obviously a lot of people listening to this podcast are either interested in starting some kind of business in here, maybe some kind of remote coaching service or have a hit studio and want to be able to increase their revenue by, um, you know, also coaching clients online or coaching, you know, doing that separately, even if people don't, th- those clients don't train in their studio. Um, so what I like about this is that you actually someone who's walked the walk, you know, there's so many people out there helping business owners who have no experience or have had no success doing that business themselves. I mean, there, that is, that is probably the norm, unfortunately. Um, and so that's, and that's kind of partly one of the reasons for me, um, that I'm obviously going to be starting this personal training business, even though in my own membership, I'm more of a facilitator and I leverage experts like Luke Carlson, who obviously have the, the track record. Um, and some people, yeah, it's interesting. Some people say, oh, well, as long as you're getting people results, what does it matter? And I don't know, maybe it's just a personal philosophy, ethical thing for me, but I feel like you do have to walk the walk really, if you're going to be giving people that advice. So I really respect that about, you know, what you're doing and that you're, you're certainly continuing to do both things, you know, helping people get mm-hmm. great results and also helping people, um, build their own business in this capacity. Um, talk to me about some of the results you've got in the past. Because I'm thinking, you know, some people might be thinking, well, I, I'm interested in um, signing up for this uh, and maybe working with Gary long term. But, you know, maybe they're interested in learning about some of the clients you've worked with in the past and the kind of results you've got. So could you talk about that for a moment? Yeah, I think just coming back to sort of, you know, online hit coaching versus, you know, in-person hit coaching is is just realizing that that big distinction you know, it's very, very easy to train someone in front of your face. You can show them all the form. You can push them really, really hard. And then when they go home, you can discover that they can pretty much make their body continue to look shit because they're going to eat whatever, drink whatever. Um, and they think that, you know, the cheeky, you know, two half hour sessions with you a week are enough to undo those bad habits. And then when you shift to an online model, you you have people that, you know, you give them a hit program, you give them some videos to follow um, they might send you some videos so you can critique their form and go back and forth a little bit. But for, for most of the time, you don't really know how good they're performing inside the gym apart from what they give you in a log sheet. But what you do notice is that the dietary advice, when they follow it, when you coach them properly, you know, results in these sort of 20 to 40 pound losses of fat in three to four months and completely transform how they look. And it's it's almost to the point where the online coaching produces much better results in terms of, you know, before and after photos because, you know, it is pulling those levers on diets and habits that are much more critical for making a body look good. So you kind of discover, you know, which which might upset a lot of hit people, but it really devalues your, high, your specific high-intensity training skills in many regards. You kind of realize that um, – you know, getting someone in shape and being an online coach, even though you might use HIT as the the form of training for for the muscle building element, and it's an effective, great way to train. Um, you realize that your ability to get inside someone's head and sell a message to them, um, and to show them with with great cl- clarity the metrics and the actions that they need to really focus down on, um, they're the critical things for online coaching. So you know, when I'm you know helping people in the HIT community, you know, build out a system of training someone, it's it's kind of teaching them to kind of go, listen, I, I get that you're a HIT expert, but it's not going to matter all that much, eh? Hey? Like as long as people lift weights and don't hurt themselves, it, it'll kind of, you know, it'll do okay. They'll get some good results, but you, you can't control what's in the room. But building up systems of accountability for, you know, what they eat in a day and how they measure it and how they report it to you and what body metrics and weight scale metrics and at what intervals and what resolution you take all of these these bits of data. And then just the the skill of the coaching call or, or how you present a data tracking Google sheet, you know, all these things are super critical for, for building a successful online coaching business. So, um I just try to kind of really simplify and, and systematize online training and coaching to v- very small numbers of things, you know, just daily calories, weekly body weight, and monthly waist circumference. That's pretty much my, my, my mantra for online training. That's all it is. That's all you need. Um, and just teaching people to kind of build simplicity and make it easy for people to comply um, is the way to do it. Um 
continue? <laughs> you may speak. You got to ask the question, Jeff. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, I was going to ask you, you know, I think it might be quite interesting for listeners just to um, get a quick preview in, in I guess, you know, um, how we're going to be doing this together. You know, um, it's interesting for me because I'm thinking, oh, um, do I really want to track my calories? Can I be bothered to report that to you? Would you insist that I do? You know, so what, just knowing me, knowing what you know about me and what I'm like, um, how would you, how would you work with me? How, how would our relationship begin in this capacity? Well, I think at the end of the day, you don't have a, a fat problem. You know, you're naturally lean. Um, so if anything, natural, you probably like that's gone into this, mate. <laughs> well, I, I reckon you would naturally under eat for sure. Um, so what, one of the two things we could do is, is you know, I know you kind of like elimination diets, things like carnivore and things like that interest you. And I think a lot of that's because it's um, it's efficient and it takes away decision fatigue because you are busy. Um, so, you know, that works for you. I think the, the biggest focus, you know, with me training you would be seeing if we can, you know, push the, the needle a little bit genetically in terms of building muscle. Um, so even though I've given that big, long polemic before about how normally I'm helping people lose fat and doing this, this and this, I think with you, we're actually going to double down on high intensity training. Um, I think we're going to go back to the drawing board. I'm probably going to ask to look at your old journals and, and just see, you know, you know, what's your training schedule been like? What's your exercise selection been like? Shoot me a couple of videos if you're performing the various exercises and let me just make sure all the fundamentals are right. So they're the things I really want to sort of check out just to make sure that, you know, because it's, it's really easy to sit here and talk about high intensity training in the abstract and say the correct sentence and use the correct buzzword. Um, but until you watch someone do it, you know, you don't know, you know, they can report something to you. Um, but you don't know exactly what that means. And so, so with you, and I, I do it with most of my clients, I get them to shoot me a, a video once a week just of an exercise so that I can kind of look over everything. Because half the time, if you teach someone great form with one exercise, they can map the thinking across every exercise they do. So just probably stripping everything back, going back to fundamentals, looking at your split, um, and just rebuilding it from the start will, will be the best way to proceed with you. Um, because honestly, I don't think the diet's going to be a challenge. I don't don't see you getting fat on me anytime soon. But we might need to get you to feed up. So you might need to track for a little bit just to oh, no. push the needle calories so that we, we get a picture of what you're actually eating. Because cause say you're only hitting, you know, 2,000 or 2,200 calories a day for someone who's, you know um, – you know, a hard gainer, that, that might be way under shooting your budget for calories and you could be selling your gains short because of those choices. And even though you might feel full and it works for you and you look good, if you want to move the needle in terms of muscle size, we might need to push you to pack in a bit more calories. You know what I mean? Do you think it's perfectly possible though that we could we could try that? And I would certainly be open to that. Um, and we do it over a number of weeks and that the calorie surplus actually could make absolutely no difference whatsoever. Yeah, no, like it's absolutely possible. And that's why you track things because yeah. you you test the limits of things, you know what I mean? You you get a clear picture. But if you don't track anything and, and say a month goes by where you don't track things properly, then you've lost a whole month of data. You know, so, sometimes like it's it's almost the data at the start that's more valuable um, than, say, continuous data. It's just kind of like get a snapshot of someone's habits see what they do, see what they respond to. And then you can kind of build a profile of how they operate. You know, this person is a growth. It's like, so say I got a, like a normal client and got them to actually track what they did. You know, for the first time ever, they're going to get out of food scale. They're going to weigh everything they eat and they're going to report it to me. They're going to see what an asshole they've been. You know what I mean? They're going to see that, holy fuck, I thought I ate 2000 a day. Turns out I ate, you know, 3,700 a day, seven days a week. Well, of course, you're going to put on three, four kilos, five kilos of fat every single year, you know, and you're going to be a pig in, you know, half a decade. So, like, it's getting people to bring all those choices up to that level of awareness and consciousness so that you can develop agency, you know, that ability to control your impulses and your temptations and to be fully aware of the choices you're making and what impact they have on your body. That's what tracking's about. Like, it's not. It's not about, you know, being a big Nazi about things and, you know, report everything. I need to know everything. It's it's kind of you reporting to yourself in many ways. I just kind of 
go over it and I provide that accountability and that decidability. So when I see certain factors, I ask certain questions based on those responses. I direct action so that you don't have to overthink it or you don't make a wrong step. I kind of do it for you because I can kind of sit back from it and be a bit more impartial and I don't get neurotic about it and overthink it, which we all do about ourselves. You know, I know, you know, for myself, you know, when, when certain training problems occur or your progress stores for a little while, it can be very frustrating and you'll overthink it and you'll, you know, radically change your routine when all you really needed to do was add an extra rest day or go to bed at nine o'clock instead of, you know, 11 o'clock because you've been watching Netflix like an arsehole. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> You're totally so, right. I have a, I have a, I have a so, bullet. So, yeah. So like that art of coaching is just, it's just so you don't have to be a neurotic mess making decisions that, you know, I can quickly see at a glance and push you in the right direction and then you can do it and get back to the rest of your day. That's what a coach does. You know, it's pretty simple. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's exciting. I it's funny you say all that because um I've got a bullet here for my conversation with John and it just says reconciling need for recovery versus as becoming asymptotic versus efficacy versus sticking point mechanical or muscle fiber. So it's like you can get so bogged down in this stuff. <laughs> And I'm not yeah. even sure how John's going to respond to that. It's not even really uh, made up into a question yet. I need to think about that in a moment. Um, but but yeah, it's um, just to what you said there. We can get very bogged down in all the nuances because you know at the end of the day, training training is both very simple and very complicated depending on the resolution right that you want to take. Yep. And so working with someone like you will really help uh, help me with some of that. Um, all right, Gary. So what's the best way for people to find out? Uh, obviously, we, in terms of the program, uh, please go to highintensitybusiness.com forward slash HD retro. Um, but if they want to find out more about you, what's the best place for them to go? Uh, find me at Intense Gains on Instagram or come see me on Facebook just under my name, Gary Knight. You know, yeah. I'm, I'm your friend, so anyone who follows you should be able to find me on the friends list or commenting Acqu- on there acquaintance, somewhere. Acquaintance, acquaintance, mate. You know, yeah, friends, like a bit, friends a little I'm, I'm bit strong, a big, isn't it? <laughs> I'm, not, I'm, not a big, I'm not a big like funnel guy. I don't really care much about subscription. Like, I'm pretty much like I'm a normal person that happens to be a whiz kid at HIT. You know, you've got a question, come chat to me, get, get in my orbit and go from there, you know. And if one day you, you, you know, want to want to kick it with a three, four month transformation with me, then we go from there. But, um, you know, get to know me, be friends with me. That's that's the best way. I, I don't want you to go to some abstract website and, you know, buy my book straight away or something like that. Just come chat to me. I'm a human. Yeah. Yeah, you are. And, and no, I obviously have enormous respect for what you do. And I know you get great results for people, people that I know. Um, and this is the role I want to play in this is to try and, um, you know, do my best to promote people like you and, and ultimately get more people uh, doing this kind of strength training and being much more objective about their health and fitness journey. So um, people go on over to highintensitybusiness.com forward slash HD retro to sign up for, uh, for Gary's program on this. Um, so that's what the blog post is going to be. All the things we discussed today will be there as well. Um, and for all episodes, please go to highintensitybusiness.com forward slash podcast. And until next time, thank you very much for listening. Discover how to achieve your health and fitness goals, become a great personal trainer, and build a successful high-intensity training business. Check out highintensitybusiness.com, highintensitybusiness.com.